once upon a time, when I was a little boy, I really, really, really hated doing my household chores. And just like in Hollywood movies, I wanted to have a robot do the chores for me, and most importantly, become my friend. For that reason, I've dedicated most of my professional life to the idea of studying machine learning and robotics. Unfortunately, the first thing which happens to you when you get into this field is that you actually see, oh, this dream isn't new at all. In fact, it has been thought of already 50 years ago. What you see here is the first robot commercial ever. It was aired in 1969, one year after the first industrial robot was ever built. And as you will see in a moment, you don't want this particular robot in your home. <laughs> now, what is special about what actually happened here? They really did take smart engineers and made them program this robot. Programming means you move 20 centimeters to the forward, 10 centimeters down, 30 centimeters to the right, and you have this program. But if one of these cups, one of these pots, stood at a different location, this program would fail, and none of this would actually happen. So every morning, you would need a new programmer in your home. Now, that is, of course, not the solution to bring you a household robot to your home, as we all pretty much agree upon. Now, 1969, that is obviously a long time ago, as you notice from the social behavior. So since 1969, a lot happened. We have better computers, we have faster computers, we have smaller computers, we have cheaper computers. So you may be saying, oh, robots should be working in a totally different way as well. And no. What you see here is a typical car manufacturing robot factory. Every one of these robots is accurate up to 150 micrometers. It knows nothing about the car, it only knows move right, move left, move down, move up, and that's it. It doesn't get much better when you look at the more modern lawnmower robot. The lawnmower robot has a little wire below the lawn, and it just follows this wire and will perform exactly the same path over and over again. And finally, any one of you who's bought a Roomba, I'm sure there's a lot in the audience, well, you know the first thing you do is you arrange your furniture so that this robot doesn't get stuck. <laughs> so what is it that we're actually doing wrong? Well, what we're doing is we're adapting our environment to the robot. And that is not a very smart strategy. So for that reason, we decided to move on and to look what humans do. What do humans actually do better? Well, humans do not adapt their environment to them they adapt to their environment. And how do they do this? Well, they do imitation learning and they do reinforcement learning, which you can basically see as self-improvement. So we thought, how can we endow our robots with this ability? Since robots should learn too, since then they could operate in any environment. And you should really importantly notice, learning is not programming. Instead, Learning usually should start, we started out with imitation. So we took the robot by the hand. In this case, this is a ball bouncing task with a ball on a string. That's why it's so fast. And after being shown a single example, this robot could reproduce the behavior. And as you see, it's actually pretty <laughs> nice. Now, this we actually, I actually asked one of my smartest students and asked him, can you program this behavior? And he spent six months with the best engineering methods, and he could not program this behavior you know, so that it would hit the ball more than two times. So quite clearly, imitation learning already beats programming. But we all know that imitation learning is never enough. Everyone who's ever learned tennis knows, well, the tennis, te tennis teacher takes you by the hand, shows you this is a forehand, this is a backhand, and nevertheless, 
it takes you 300 trials before you get the first ball over the net. This is the job of self-improvement uh, or reinforcement learning, but you should always start with a good starting point, which you get from imitation. So here we have a ball in a cup, or balero as the Spanish call it, uh, where we bring this little ball into the cup by a jerky, nice movement. But the robot fails by imitation learning because it cannot produce the accelerations the human can produce, and it only has a single example which doesn't give it hand-eye coordination. But you see, it self-improves, and we give it school grade. It's so uh, one for a very good robot, uh, f six for a very bad robot, and it self-improves. Initially, it fails, but it gets a little bit better. After about 40-something trials, it sometimes gets it right, sometimes gets it wrong, slightly wrong, and finally, it gets better and better, it gets better grades all the time, and still not. But after usually around 90-something trials, it gets the ball into the cup basically all the time. And this is actually pretty amazing when you think about it. Now, children learn this behavior at the six, age of 6 to 8, not at all. At the age of 10 to 12, they are about as fast as our algorithm, but they never become perfect. Our algorithm actually becomes perfect. And that's despite that we use chocolate as rewards for the children, while the robot only gets school grades. It seems to be only me who took actually three months to learn this behavior. <coughs> so then I showed this to my boss back then, and he said, well, Jan, it's all very nice, but when are you doing something difficult? And I asked him, well, what do you mean by difficult? Isn't this difficult? He said, well, I used to play a lot of table tennis in my youth, so why don't you teach your robot to play table tennis? So we took the robot by the hand, we showed the robot, this is the forehand, this is the backhand, and it started playing. This is playing against the ball gun, and you see next the robot playing against its teacher, and I should say my PhD student, she actually learned table tennis for her PhD. And as an advisor, I, can s I believe I dare be able to say the robot is just about as good as she is by now. <laughs> so this is nice, but you noticed one thing in this video. Since in this video you saw the robot was actually only using forehands. This is actually good reason. The robot has a two kilogram wrist, and it's a pretty huge movement with a two kilogram wrist through the space is to move from a forehand to a backhand, and it's somewhat unpleasant to the robot. It, it minimizes many chances. And we were nevertheless puzzled about this. Why doesn't our algorithm become smarter? And so we decided to study what humans do again. And we invited professional table tennis players, so people who play at the European champion level, into our lab. We recorded their movements and tried to figure out how do they do it. We didn't learn anything from their movements, but one of them to told us when he looked at our laboratory setup, well, why are you guys having cameras looking at the ball? We were puzzled. As computer scientists, we want to, of course, pretty see the ball. He said, no, we are trained not to look at the ball. We are trained to look at the opponent. So we decided, let's add three cameras, let's look at the opponent, and let's try to use the human arm movements to predict what the human will be doing before the human has even touched the ball. And this is the amazing part. Already, long before the human has touched the ball with the pedal, it's purely out of the arm movement, you can predict where the human will play the ball with an accuracy of 30 centimeters, yes, and take a predictive stance decide whether you're going to do a forehand or backhand, and subsequently do the right kind of a movement. So intention is really crucial, crucial here. Now, does this bring us the scenario of I robot tomorrow? Will we have our household robot tomorrow? Probably not. But we are living in a transition age. Up to this age, robots were doing exactly one task, millions of times. Right now, we have this age for robot learning. The key method of artificial intelligence is entering the field of robotics and actually allows us to learn more and more tasks 
with the result that we will get an explosion of new tasks and finally robots which will get, well, become more and more useful for all of us. Now, is this a myth? Well, look at this example here. This here is actually an operation scene in a hospital as you have them all over the world. A master surgeon, who also has to be a master robot operator, sits in the uh, station and joysticks a robot around to make a tiny cut in your prostata. It's actually the only way we can do such operations. But right now, you need a surgeon who knows both robotics and surgery and has to be really good at that one particular operation. Now imagine what robot learning could do here for you. You could have the master surgeon in your hospital just in form of a learned program. Now, while my twins are still capable of breaking any fixed programmed robot today, they are actually going to be the first generation which are going to be using in robots which are learning from them and adapt to them, learn their tasks from them, and, and bring this into the future technology and use this as future technology users. For that, thank you.